Oh, oh, TC. Hey, that's that's cool. cool. You got a podcast? Well, I didn't didn't know know that. that. That's cool. How you do? Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are back with another exciting episode of Oh, That's Cool, OTC's very own podcast on all the fantastic people we work with here at Ozarks Technical Community College. I, of course, am Jared Durden, and with me as always... I'm Andrew Crocker, and exciting, exciting is the right word. I'm so happy to be talking about the thing that we're talking about today, but I'm also excited for you and I. We're just kind of coming a little bit down off the high of the uh, of the Higdon train, we we rode the Higdon train in our last episode. What did you think? What did you think of just getting to sit down and just chatting about presidents, monarchies? I had a lot with of fun. The OTC monarch himself. Absolutely. Well, I, I yeah, I had a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed uh, 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 the conversation in general, and just uh, again, that was one of those episodes where I learned all these things that it's just it's outside of my wheelhouse and and i got to know well i did you appreciate the title of the episode did you notice i did appreciate yes right? so stephen hawking a brief, a history brief of time history. yeah 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 huh clever i did i appreciate that i should expe- i should have expected that from a physics guy yeah. i'm actually surprised that more physics lingo doesn't work its way into our conversation or maybe, or maybe it does and i'm just so physics ignorant that i'm not aware that you're dropping breadcrumbs physics breadcrumbs when you drop them how often are you physicsing up our conversations uh I'm a big fan of puns, so I feel like usually that's how I work things in. Like I've got a really good physics joke. The problem with physics jokes, though, is that you, you've got to know the the background enough. So okay, so two identical cats are on uh, the point of a roof, right? Two identical cats. One of them though slides off, and the other one doesn't. Do you know why? Why? Because he had one had a greater mew. <laughs> so this is funny. Yeah. Because mu is the coefficient of friction. Uh uh-huh. the variable used for coefficient so of friction. So how far into your semester do we need to get before you can Cat crack makes. that joke? Uh, it depends on which course you take, actually. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, I'm also excited because um, I now have a, an excuse to actually work out. Uh, we, You and I were talking. After we had a conversation in this exact room with the great Michelle Selinsky, we had talked about Tough Mudders and the ridiculousness of Tough Mudders, and you and I are chewing on the idea of actually doing one now that there's one in Missouri in late April. That's what it was. I was trying to remember. That's yes. right. And so we need some, we need some, uh, we need some, we need to find some suckers. How many people do some we need patsies. on a team? So whatever. Okay. There was a quite, here's a, let me, after just uh, asking you about physics, let me politicize that question a little bit. Somebody once, the myth goes that somebody once asked Abraham Lincoln, how tall does a man need to be? And Abraham Lincoln answered, tall enough for his legs to touch the ground. (laughs) And so we just need a group that will help us get the job done. When I did it, we did it with like five people, but surely we can get two or three patsies on this campus. So this is our call out if you want to join us. So do you have more details? I already already have the, uh, I already have the people I have in mind. But if we, if we, this is a casting call, consider this a casting call. Open call. call. Open call. When is it again? Uh, it is April 30th through May 2nd, so there's a couple days you could do it. There's different levels of difficulty. We could do a 5K, a 10K, a 15K, and then there's a kids one. I, I don't think we'll have kids with us. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, but uh, uh, consider this a casting call, although the people who should be interested, you have already been contacted by me. I will bring you in. I will break you down. It will happen. I will warn you, I am incredibly competitive and I don't I never mean to I always go in like oh I'm just gonna have fun but like when I when I'm in a race as soon as someone starts to pass me there's something in my brain mm-hmm. that goes well I can't let them and well you know you know the whole point of Tough Mudder is actually teamwork uh, you want to do well absolutely so my point is and survive is, uh, th- so the, then this encompasses the whole team like, yes this, we're gonna we're gonna win. okay good well, I'm glad that we have a team captain we have a, essentially Jared has named himself team captain we're gonna get this done for team Durden. We Get need a done. team name. We'll have to work on that. Okay. See if you can work some of your physics metaphors in, and maybe we can. Fantastic. Yeah. So today, uh, as you as you said, we are we are excited. Uh, 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 we've got a topic that we're really interested in into delving into, uh, and so we have brought on um, an an expert uh, to help us talk about that. Uh, with us today is Kelly Miller. How are you today? I'm good. I'm Ke- glad to be here. I'm excited to be here. Uh, Kelly, do you have uh, psychology jokes that you like to break up? <laughs> yeah. I, 
can't think of it. Now you put me on the spot. <laughs> you didn't tell me I needed a joke. <laughs> I like being funny and kind of witty, but uh, I don't know if I have any psychology jokes. I may have one. Okay. I want you to tell, first of all, kleptomania, does that count as a psychology? Certainly. Okay. Um, why can you not use metaphors around kleptomaniacs? <laughs> I don't know. Because they take everything literally. <laughs> That's like That's the economy. The economy of that joke alone is outstanding. <laughs> so, Kelly, tell us um, about yourself, your relationship to the college. Well, I have been here since 2004. I was an adjunct in 2004 for seven years um, and then got on full time and have been, I guess, full time for nine years or something. So I've taught psychology. I teach introduction to psychology, abnormal psychology and lifespan psychology. Before um, I taught psychology, I was a therapist. Um, and worked in different areas of psychology, mental health psychology, because there's different fields of psychology, but I work, I have always worked in the mental health field and then have taught. So that's, I probably dates me, I'm pretty old, but anyway, yeah. When you say, and this is coming from a place of ignorance here, <laughs> lifespan mm -hmm. psychology what is that in a that nutshell that is developmental psychology so how we change from conception through death all the things that change us so who are you today and how did you become who you are mm. cognitively physically emotionally and socially and the thing is we change throughout all of our decades and we have different needs throughout all of our decades and different things change us and so there's an actual field of psychology that studies how we change and the patterns of growth and development and what is like i hate to use the word normal but just the normal growth of a human and if that's not happening maybe what's going wrong what, what, um, what's the what's that statistic that they always say they say that um the human brain isn't quote unquote fully developed until about in the mid 20s so what does that even mean what's it because we are driving at 16 so what's the difference what am i missing <laughs> but, at it, but even insurance companies know that is a correct That's statistic right. because insur your insurance rate is rates are so high at 16 and they drop at 25. No kidding. So, yes. Okay, so what, what does that? It's the frontal lobe that's not fully developed and our frontal lobe is um, where we make decisions. And so we have what's called a limbic system and that's in our, that's kind of our older part of our brain where it's a reactive part of our brain. And so we uh, make some decisions from that emotional reactive part when we're younger. Think of um, the decisions you made when you were 15. You may not want to be held responsible for all those decisions. Um, and then the decisions that you make at 25 should be more guided by the frontal lobe and experience and reason. And so the frontal lobe begins to connect and develop more fully as we get into our mid-20s so that is why you know just the things if you want to refer to driving when you were 16 the things that you would have done driving are probably different than what you would do now as far as choices you make how fast you go you know those kind of things same thing with life your decisions hopefully get get more reasonable as you age I have kind of a rule of thumb that if I can't look back 10 years and think man I was dumb then right. I'm not you're not growing I'm not and on changing. the right path. I'm right. not doing the right so, thing. So, so part of development is learning from experience, and some of us do that better than others. But as we as we gain decades, we have more experience, and we learn. So, even intelligence changes. You're quicker at a younger age if, as far as intelligence goes. But I always ask my students, would you want a surgeon that's 50 years old who's had 20 years of experience in the field, or do you want a surgeon that has the better eye hand coordination at 25? You know, and probably you want the more experience because they are going to know what to do in a crisis. And I assume that that continues throughout your life because, um, again, coming from the politics perspective, mm -hmm. we had two presidential candidates in 2020, both in their mid to late 70s. Right. And the nice thing about them is that we can kind of compare and contrast to how they were decades ago. Right. Biden, for the record, seems to be roughly as sharp as he always has been but in his presentation he was quicker and right. sharper and right. more assertive <clears throat> donald trump i feel as a as a presidential candidate as a president sometimes has trouble getting his exact thoughts out but if you go back 20 30 40 years back right. when reagan was president it sounds like a completely different guy um, is that cognitive what is causing that slower well as we age um, our experience and, and wisdom, I think, comes from applying experience, but our experience gets better. But 
when you get into the 70s and 80s, you are going to find sometimes word finding is hard, harder, like being able to find the words you need. So memory doesn't necessarily slip until you're that in that age. Um, and then it's going to be, again, finding words. Um, you may be slower to come up with concepts and ideas. Um because the some of the brain just it just slows down. But th- that's not through ex- aging. that's not cognitive loss necessarily. No, it's not cognitive loss, but the brain does kind of start shrinking at a certain age. Is it so normal just... that sometimes I walk into a room and just find myself <laughs> standing there for yes. a good minute okay. or two? And I think the funny thing about that is when you're 20, you do that. Right. You can't find your like you go to your bedroom and like I'm looking for a book and you can't remember what you're there for. And when you hit 40, you do the same thing. But you're worried about having Alzheimer's. So then that's what you think. Ah. You know, so when I'm 40 and do the same thing I did at 20 at 40, I think, oh, my gosh, I'm losing my mind. Uh, Ma'am, what led you from uh, what I would think would be a fascinating and rewarding field of therapy to what you're Um, doing now? I had babies and I had children and so I was working actually at a rape crisis center um, treating um, children and adults who'd had um, sexual abuse in their life and then I had a baby and um, that it got tougher and then also um, I like working on this side I like having a purpose and feeling like I'm making a difference but this side feels positive sometimes and the other side gets really heavy. Um, to be honest, some of the things that I was dealing with, it gets really hard. And so also, this job allows you to be home with your kids um, when they're off of school. And that is some of it. So I like the positive nature of being able to influence and educate students. And also just practically, I when I was a parent, I could be around for my kids when they were home. Um, did you feel like working a job? I worked at, prior to being full-time at OTC, I worked at uh, Springfield Green County 911. Mm. You work a 10-hour, 12-hour shift of that. You do feel on your drive home, and for the rest of the day, you've just lost a bit of yourself. Yes. I, I, I don't know if that's the right way of saying it. Well, you, you just get a feel bit of that like, yourself? you just kind of feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders, and also you just kind of see a different part of life, and I want... I want to, again, have that sense of purpose and feel like I'm helping people, but I want to be on the part where I can encourage and inspire people to change their life. And I think you can do that in therapy, but I feel like education, you can do it as well. And so it just kind of, I think as I aged, it was just a better fit. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now you are also, I like to do this every time we have a half of a power couple on this podcast. We've had the, the great Grace and Forsey on before. And uh, you are half of a power couple here at OTC. The other half, of course, is uh, everybody's favorite, Mark Miller. Um, working, I, I... I was here longer than him. Okay, he so he was, uh, you were, you set I the groundwork, I was here work, longer, huh? so. <laughs> How did that come to be? Uh, well, I was here since 2004. He used to work on TV. He worked at other places, and then he came here, and he does a fantastic job. He is more visible than I am, and I prefer it that way. I'm an I'm an extroverted introvert, and he's an extroverted extrovert. What, what does that What does that mean? <laughs> we actually have some history uh, because when he was on TV, he used to cover um, some work I used to do at jury. So when I was going to jury in 2005 to 2008, he um, uh, I was doing this thing called a gravity test. Uh, I started up a, a society of physics students, and we started getting involved with the community, and he came and covered me a couple times because um, we used to throw toilets and stuff off the roof. <laughs> yeah, but we got, talking about But that. we got into uh, – they, they, they did a larger national piece on it in the um, – Oh, what's that called? I'm going to have to do an I messed up. See, I'm forgetting words. Uh, <laughs> Better check that frontal lobe. How did yeah. we get here? Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> uh, he used to, and so I've got a picture of me and him <laughs> from like 2006, yeah. both looking younger yeah. and really yes. intently at each other. Like it's kind of a cool picture. <laughs> and a, a friend of mine in town that's a photographer took it and it's in black and white. I'll, 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 I'll let you guys see it. Um, so yeah, so I've known Mark professionally since for some time before yeah. before both of us ended up here too, which yeah. was interesting. 
What, what is an extrovert and introvert? Is that what you said? <laughs> uh, so or I'm an introvert. An introvert extroversion is a spectrum of personality. Uh-huh. An introvert typically gains energy from quiet space. And so I call myself an extroverted introvert where I like people and I like going out socially, but I have to have quiet time to re-energize. Hmm. And an extrovert tends to re-energize by being around people. See, I've always had a rule of thumb, again, just at, coming at this as a layman, I've always had a rule of thumb. And my rule of thumb is when you spend your time around people, does um, does that uh, does that charge you up That's or charge ex- you down? And so if it charges you up, you're an extrovert. Uh-huh. If it drains you, you're an introvert. Doesn't mean you don't like people, but right, you need yeah. quiet time mm-hmm. to recharge. You get charged up or charged down, Jared. So I'm going to say you're an extroverted extrovert. I, yeah. I just, okay. if, the, if there is like a, we actually had this exercise before. You and I were in a cohort where they had an exercise. Right. Where they lined people across a room. Where were you in the room on this spectrum? Uh, you know, I, I, that's, this is one of those things when it, when it comes to that kind of stuff. I, I, I don't feel like I'm one thing. And so it kind of depends on the day. That's an ambervert. An ambervert. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in the middle. So it's a spectrum trait, meaning that no one's a pure extrovert or a pure introvert. We all fall on the the spectrum somewhere. An ambervert's right in the middle. Like an ambidextrous. And if you remember the other test we took, I was the weirdo that was in every column. (laughs) I don't remember. You were in every column? Yeah, me and Kara Griffin Mm -hmm. were the only ones that that had those results like people tended to have that is i I know care very well that's sketchy company to be in (laughs) it's a good thing we have a therapist in the room right now uh (laughs) views expressed on this podcast are solely those of the ones i speak for the college when i say (laughs) (laughs) Uh, of course uh we uh just uh, express our own opinions uh (laughs) but i know mark our good friend mark miller he's must be a very extroverted person uh, to have the position that he has he is he's he can talk to anyone he loves being around people and Again, I love being social, but I just, I'm going to need some quiet time to recharge myself. And you know, my favorite thing about him is we actually had a local reporter just get another job and she went to another part of the country and uh, she was on campus and she's interviewed me several times. Mark Miller always put that stuff together, but he, uh, she invited me to the Starbucks on campus and who's there talking to her, wishing her good luck, <laughs> Yeah. but Mark Miller. So he, it's his job. He has to reach out and work yeah. with these people, but he's like he, he gives them part of himself right. and he takes that he, he, he does such a great job building connections while doing his job yeah i mean he's I been in that. the field of been on tv so he knows what that's like and you know if you have a get a get a better job then why wouldn't a colleague say great job you know and i mean that's yeah for that's sure that's a great thing to do and yes he's very he's very encouraging and to the younger reporters in town does he, do you ever get a, like an inside scoop? You yourself end up on TV or? Oh, I've I've done interviews before mm-hmm. when he's needed an expert in my area. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we don't have but to not, do. <laughs> we don't have to do like the um, what do they call it? A conflict of interest, like a warning. <laughs> no, I don't, no, no. So we'll have to bring Mark on for sure at some point. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I want to I want to bring it back. To, to Kelly, um, one of the uh, questions that we'd like to ask is, um, who is a hero of yours? Someone that you would like the podcast listeners to know about, someone you look up to or have been inspired by? Oh, so many people. I mean, um, I love the study of how humans thrive and flourish. So I follow a lot of different like psychology type people on media and research and stuff. So like, I don't know if you've ever heard of Brene Brown. She does a lot of great work in the field of human flourishing. Um, and Adam Grant's an organizational psychologist that I read a lot about how we live to live our best lives. So those are the kind of people that I like to read and follow. Um, Kate Bowler is a professor of divinity at duke but she has a podcast called um everything happens and that's it not for a reason and i think i started following her because of her story about you know sometimes we can't control what happens in life and not everything's positive yeah and so she when you say they teach flourishing mm-hmm. that means teaching attempting to live your best life mm-hmm. i feel like, like i'm just asking you what you're no, talking about no i mean it's like So for many decades and years, psychology studied what went wrong with humans. And that's abnormal psychology, and I teach that about mental illness. But decades ago, they started studying how we thrive. What does our best life look like? 
and how can we live our best life? So there's lots of research about that. Some call it the field of happiness, positive psychology. And by positive psychology, I don't mean glossing over the bad things that happen to us, but more about how to live a meaningful, happy, fulfilled life. And there's studies and research about that. So maybe top three quick synopsis, what's your biggest takeaways? Well, I've, I've done a lot of studies on that and where culture and society um, kind of, kind of not forces us, but points us towards status and money as our happiness, what really makes us happy is connection to other people, um, purpose in life, um, having enough sleep, having enough downtime, having things outside of our work, having personal relationships that are supportive. Those are the things. I think I said more than three. Sorry. I can't count. I'm not math. I had <laughs> actually seen a study, a fascinating study, that asked people, how much more money do you think you, sh you could make compared to right now to feel truly comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think the average response among all respondents was 20% or 25, mm -hmm. 20, 25%. Oddly enough, the biggest outlier of that was the wealthy mm -hmm. who believed that they needed like 30, 35%. So it's interesting how it, it can create a little bit of a black hole mm -hmm. where the pursuit of it and the accomplishment of it only inspires the desire for more of it. But then you're not happy. Right. And yeah. that's, I think, the interesting thing. It's funny because my my son, who's a college student, he goes, what I've seen is that the wealthy, when you ask them about it, they always kind of downplay how much they, they make because they want to fit into the category of where everyone else is. Because when you're super wealthy, you're very isolated. And the poor people kind of elevate how much they make. So it's like he goes, like, everyone wants to be middle class mm. because that's where most people are. And then that's where you feel connected. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I bet most people think of themselves that way too, yeah. because uh, 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 just demographically, we tend to hang out with people in our income right. levels. You'll, you know, some people that aren't as well off as you uh, materially. Some yeah. people that are a little bit more. It's so right. just everybody kind of feels naturally floating in the middle there. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's, I mean, you have to have enough money to pay your bills and live. You know, be able to live your life, and then once you've got that, your happiness doesn't go up based on income after that. Mm. Our happiness increases when we're connected, when we feel a sense of purpose, when we have enough time to do the things that we enjoy. That's what makes people happy. So I think that's an interesting field. That's good. and there, there's a there's a, a ranking they do right, like a happiness index, mm -hmm. uh, which looks at at what actually makes people happy and, and kind of breaks mm -hmm. the world. Uh, do you remember? Or, uh, you Denmark. Know, Denmark is the happiest, that's right. And when you look at the Netherlands, they have social safety nets for their citizens. They have universal health care, but also personal um, things that they do is they have long dinners with each other as family and friends. They have time off to have connections with each other. You know, they have more education because it's available to the them. The educational system is yeah. impressive. Right. And, and so, it looks very different. Yeah. And so they have access to educate more education. Um, so those things help them flourish as a country and make them happier. Um, it's interesting how different cultures can work towards that, too. Like mm -hmm. there is a there's an international crisis going on in China regarding the Uyghurs, which mm -hmm. are Muslims that live in China. But one of the things we learned about their culture is that it is very common for the entire Uyghur family to sleep in the same bed and mm -hmm. I imagine that's kind of just another way of achieving a, a, a familial close. intimacy yeah yeah, yeah. Um, you know I I'm older than you guys but when I was growing up most people had smaller homes you know what I mean and you shared a bathroom not that I want to share a bathroom but you know <laughs> you did and you just you gathered more you know as a family whereas I think our, our larger homes now allow us to be disconnected even in that way. And I think our technology, I'm not against technology, but I think it does, it, technology does not lead to feeling more connected with, that, with, the, with each other. Which is complex, right? Because yes, it there's is complex. so much of it, you, you know, you, you see you see opportunities for people to connect yes. at a distance, right. but it seems to separate the people that are in close location. Right. I mean, it's a great way to stay in contact with your friends and family that live far away, but when you are in the same city, neighborhood, and you're not getting together, 
personally face to face, it doesn't feel more connected. And I, I don't say this without, you know, admitting I do it myself, but when you walk around sometimes and just see everyone head down mm -hmm. on their phone. Right. Right. You know, there's a it, there's a great podcast about the office called The Office Ladies. It's a, it's run by uh, Pam Beasley and Angela yeah. Kinsey, whatever the name the real names are. Yeah. Anyways, they were talking about an episode where Ryan caught fire in the office, and so they all had to stand out in the parking lot. And that was that episode aired before smartphones were really pervasive. So what did they do in the parking lot in that fictional example? Is they kind of all stand around and they're like, okay, if you had to marry a celebrity, and you just cut, they they talked a little bit more. And I, I remember a lot more of that now because now you're right, it's ubiquitous. You show you show up to a class at a 10 a.m. class at 9:58. 85, 90% of the people in the room are just kind of isolated on their phones, hanging out, just killing time. And I understand it to a certain degree, but like Kelly said, I, I, I do feel like it creates, I feel like technology is really good at taking strangers and making them acquaintances, but isn't great at taking the people around you and making them friends right. or making friends into really good friends. Right. So you, just, you just can't substitute that in-person interaction. Right, like when I, I text and do all sorts of stuff with my friends all the time, but I really want to see them like once a week, you know, I want to get a group together once a week and do something, you know what I'm saying? Like that feels more connected than just texting all the time. You want to do a Tough Mudder? Um, you could ask Mark, he's doing, oh, okay. Maybe he's we will. doing a 15K at the Dogwood right. in a couple weeks. I did that 15K last year at the Dogwood, but I didn't train for it. And I'm like you, I'm competitive. And so I'm like, well, everybody else is running, I'm gonna run. And I bonked at that last heel and I'm not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> I completely whiffed on the fact that, yeah, Mark Miller, a little bit of a fitness guy for yeah. sure. I mean, I don't know if you'd want to do the Tough Mudder. You have to ask him. Oh, we'll, we'll rope him in. <laughs> so, um, Kind of to tie back to, we were talking about lifespan development and that, that development of the frontal lobe. Um, empathy is developed through face-to-face -face interactions too, right? And so uh, this might end up tying us to mm -hmm. some of our conversation later when, when we ask our big question today. But yeah, um, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's necessary that we see people face-to-face -face and we see their reactions right. on their faces based on the things that we say and do to help us develop empathy. And we, we lose that with online interactions, right. which is its own, maybe needs to be a topic that we end up mm -hmm. uh, bringing someone on are you, <laughs> just to talk about. Are you, when you send an email to somebody and you like, I think that's a great idea, don't you feel compelled to add an exclamation point? Otherwise, oh, you're face. just. Uh, other, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, they're going to say, "What is he mad?" I know. That's I'm terrified of a period with no smiley face. Or Either has like, to be if I try to do sarcasm in a text, then you're like, "Ooh, are people going to get this?" You know, <laughs> yeah. no, they're not going to get it. Got to add the uh, completely made up LOL. Yeah. You're not, but the LOL lets them know. Yeah. <laughs> How often would you say you actually laugh out loud compared to the times you write that you are laughing out loud? Give me a percentage. Single digit percentage. <laughs> really? Five percent at the time. Maybe. Definitely not laughing out loud at what I just sent on the text. <laughs> Honestly, if I if you text something and I'm really laughing, you get like a, I praise you. I, I outwardly say that is hysterical. Ha 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 ha. I don't go LOL. Nobody laughs really hard and then goes LOL. There are people in the real world that don't laugh but just say that's funny. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. So we're getting to the meat of it now. Uh, the big question, Gumby versus Mr. Ed battle to the death, who wins and the why? Horse, Dr. Mr. Ed, because he's got horse legs that could kick Gumby and big teeth that could bite him. Yeah, he is, he's there's no question horse, he's got the strength power, advantage. The power, like horse legs, come on. There's, there's big, no horse power actually came from right, horses. Right, big horsey right. legs could yeah. kick, I mean, Gumby's like this, you know, like, you know, he's malleable and he's, Seems lightweight to yeah. me. I don't know. So yeah, I know, think Mr. Ed, all he has to do is get that back horse legs out and kick him. He ha he has a. a <laughs> I th now you raise an interesting point. I hadn't considered strength. I just considered the malleability of Gumby and his indestructibility. Yeah, but, if Mr. but is he strong Ed enough to take on a horse? the right angle. He just has to kick with his back yeah. legs, and Gumby goes through the stratosphere over the moon. I think, you know. Mm. 
And then he could bite him with his big horsey teeth. <laughs> I know how to fight him. One of five. Come on. <laughs> Have you ever heard the uh, argument? Would you rather uh, the the argument over whether would you rather fight a duck sized uh, a hundred duck sized horses or one horse sized duck? No. Yeah. See, our arguments always were about superheroes, and would you rather be Batman or Superman or whatever? Oh, so. yeah, for sure. Yeah, but I didn't. I've never heard of that one. Yeah, well, you have oh, to go. Oh, one horse-sized duck. Ducks have no defensive capabilities whatsoever. They have a gigantic. I have a lot beak. of duck experience. They have a gigantic beak, and they have wings that can welt you. You think that you have a chance? <laughs> they can fly. You'd have a chance against a horse-sized duck. Absolutely. How would you even? The, okay, I mean, spell they, the have a, they have a rounded bill, uh huh. Right? Yeah. Can they eat you? Do they have teeth? No, they have like these little like, like nodules oh. in their kind of beak. That sounds creepy to me. But like, no, <laughs> no, no way. I would I easily take a horse sized duck. Uh, you just got to figure. And they're uh-huh. chickens. I mean, they're you know. They're, they're, they're not very brave. Okay, I gotcha. I was like, no. are we confusing? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, gotcha. All right, well, I just, um, I, I think Gumby still takes it, largely because the way you're I think describing... your opinion. The, I mean, <laughs> I, hold on, let me pull out a chart here. Um, have, you the, kept, have you kept a chart of how many of your guests have chosen Gumby versus Mr. Ed? I think right oh, now we should we're, go back and do I that. I think we're right now majority Gumby. Wow. Well, but there's a... Not, I like being different. So. <laughs> but I, uh, the, the description of defeating Gumby using that method you're talking about, I mean, you got to be, you got to use some precision there. So you're really hoping that Mr. Ed could really, his eye hoof coordination Have is you fantastic. ever ridden a horse or you ever been around a horse that's mad? They can have, they have a lot of power. They are, they are huge. Yeah. Yeah. You got to think about that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, so it, it, this brings up a good point then too is, is this uh, 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 is there ever an argument you think that could convince you to switch sides oh. um, right that's the difference between skepticism and denialism so is there anything anyone could say that I could also them? think we may have settled this debate uh, in the other way because I think we should ask I think you're asking the wrong person because I'm on the winning side of this but <laughs> we said I think this debate was settled with of all people, John Herbert. And I think he settled it because I believe he correctly identified that Gumby can phase. And I actually had to YouTube it. He goes through walls, too. There's no reason why he can't. I am through. not that versed in what Gumby can do. Yeah. So. so, well, you know, I you, we can come back on a future podcast <laughs> <laughs> and review how you feel about it. But I, I, that's a good question. Maybe if just there wasn't enough physicals for Mr. Ed over the course of the show. It was all about like how clever he was and how funny he was. Yeah, it wasn't but if enough he's, about he's like, a horse. Right, yeah. And he's got some kickers on him. Yes. Yeah, maybe he never had to prove anything. Yeah. He was, <laughs> he didn't have I to think prove, he yeah. could kick somebody if he got mad enough. Yeah. I mean, I would lose against Mr. Ed. Yeah. Yeah, no he question. Would. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if this is correct directly connected to that conversation uh we brought you on today to ask the question (laughs) is andrew a psychopath (laughs) what what is a psychopath so psychopathology that term is not a medical diagnosis it's used culturally to talk about people who maybe lack empathy or conscience or don't who create or commit crimes but the medical diagnosis for that would be antisocial personality disorder and antisocial person so psychopathology and antisocial personality disorder what they share is people who lack conscious lack, lack empathy are highly charming typically manipulative um do not everyone who is a psychopath commits crimes but they don't typically have the same feelings that we have in regard to each other as far as if I hurt you or I did something against you, I would feel bad. That actually helps us as humans to survive, you know? So psychopaths, within the whole general population, there's 1% of people who are psychopaths. But not all of them are in prison. Within the prison population, you have 25 to 30 percent of criminals who would be identified as psychopaths. See, I had actually um, run across this. Uh, we had spoken before, but I, I was on uh, Twitter, mm-hmm. and somebody had just casually remarked about something on current events, and they're like, you know, this is a difficult situation. I'm talking in their voice. Let me share with you my perspective. As a psychopath, I blah blah blah, and I was like, time out. What? And then a hundred is Twitter being Twitter. A hundred people respond, and they say, "You know, I'm a psychopath too. I wish people understood this or that." And I thought that was fascinating because 
I am a layman, and when I think of a psychopath, I think America's most wanted. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. I think a maniac who wants to ruin the world. But what you're saying is, obviously, it can lead to criminal Criminal tendencies. Yeah. Yeah. What you're saying is they don't mind the consequences of their actions as much? Correct. So, and it's interesting, those Twitter people were self-identifying as Correct. psychopaths because again, they're not going to their doctor or anyone else because that's not a diagnosis. So a psychopath could be a CEO of a company who doesn't mind um, breaking all the rules so that they profit. You know, It could be people who don't mind hurting other people to profit themselves. They could be very charming, very manipulative, but they lie. They uh, tend to have lower anxiety about stuff. Um, They tend to um, even have a higher sexual drive. Um, They tend to be, again, uh, people who can look at you in the eye, lie to you, steal your money, and not ever have a a feeling of being that that, uh, what I did was bad. Have they ever determined... Uh, have they? Is it determined if it's a chemical imbalance or if it's a behavioral thing? So within the limbic system, we have this uh, small little part of our brain called the amygdala, and the amygdala is where we react to fear, um, and so and, it, and so that creates anxiety within us. And so for us as humans, that actually helps us survive because fear and anxiety typically help us do the right thing hmm. because we do, we are humans are social people and we want to be part of the social group. And so we fear not being part of the social group, which leads us to help, helping behaviors. We help each other because we want to be part of the group. They've done studies and it showed that psychopaths or people who create, commit horrible crimes tend to have a smaller amygdala, mm-hmm. which the amygdala then is connected to our frontal lobe. So the limbic system is the part of our brain that we are reactive with. So when somebody hits you in the face, your amygdala, your limbic system makes you want to punch them back. But your frontal lobe might come in and say, well, that might not be the best choice, right? Um, what and, uh, what, <clears throat> what uh, we laymen might think of id versus superego? Yeah, I mean, that's this, that's Freud's term. Okay, sure. But yeah, culturally, that's, yes. Mm. The id is just, I'm going to do it because I want to do it. Superegos are morality. And so, but if you look at biologically, it's amygdala frontal lobe. Mm. And those are connected. But if your amygdala is smaller, you're not having as many anxious responses. You're not responding with fear to punching someone in the face, to hurting them. Uh, Like, if I hurt someone, I would be thinking about it for days after. Like, I would feel bad. You know, a person with a smaller amygdala who has is identified as a psychopath or antisocial personality disorder doesn't have those kind of feelings or thoughts. They don't they do lack empathy. And empathy is one of those feelings, again, that help us survive as humans, because if we can understand how another person feels, that's going to lead to what we call pro-social behavior. And pro-social behavior helps us um, live together as humans. And so a person who's a psychopath doesn't engage in a lot of pro-social behavior unless it benefits them and gets them to what they want. Okay, does that make sense? And so they can be very charming on the surface. These are people that you might like at first and will promise you a lot of things, but will be, their emotions are felt only, they only express emotion in, in what they expect you think that they will. They're not necessarily going to feel those things. Can I counter with a pop culture example mm-hmm. and then you can pop the balloon if it's <laughs> completely wrong, please? Sure. Um, so I, I love the show The Good Place. Mm-hmm. Really, really good show. Yeah. And I'm not going to use any any spoilers here, but there is a time later in the, sh- in the show where there is a character who's a demon is mm-hmm. torturing people in the bad place. That's all I'm going to say. Mm-hmm. And the people are like, you should stop torturing us. And he's like, it's you. It's not me. Who yeah. cares? And so at one point, the characters try to break him down and say, well, what if you were more like a person? And it broke the character the character the demon completely broke and it completely changed his or her personality um is that conceivable with somebody with the conditions you're describing can you walk them through can you coach them out of it well i think you could typically it's 
there's not a there's an for antisocial personality disorder, which is what is going to be diagnosed if they meet that criteria, which is what we're talking about. There's not a high rate of being able to coach them or some do change. Now, if you see this pattern, you know, people always think, oh, I see this in a child. If you see it in a child at a young age, you can teach them empathy. Okay, so the younger you have a person, the more malleable their brain is. You, and for a person as they age with antisocial personality disorder, if they've had a lot of consequences, that they've, they've been in prison and maybe gotten a lot of therapy, maybe they can begin to learn how to mimic those feelings of compassion and empathy and eventually can engage in that way. But um, again, it's just ongoing research about can we actually change these people? And of course, I'm psychology, so I, I want to believe that people can change. It's just that they typically are a tougher population to change. Is it possible? <clears throat> is it possible that we need to be thinking of how better to direct their usage in our lives? Yeah, I mean, because there are certain areas of our lives I can imagine it could be useful to not be as consumed by right. an enhanced amygdala. Yeah, I mean, weaponized and, psychopathy. <laughs> well, I'm like, how many times when it comes to like budgeting? for businesses, for governments, for families, could could we just benefit from a, dis, a truly dispassionate person? Well, I don't think that having emotion means you aren't logical. You know what I'm saying? I think emotions and logic in making decisions can coexist. So I think having empathy and compassion can make us better as humans and make better policy for humans because we understand each other better. I see what you're saying is just being truly rational without any feeling, but I don't know that that is really uh, going to lead to a better society, in my opinion. You know, so again, that's just an opinion. Um, Here's, here's. I think empathy helps us be altruistic and pro-social, and I think pro-social behavior helps us advance as humans. That's um, my thought. So I, I, I have to, I have to, ch- I have to challenge you on something. Yeah. As a parent mm-hmm. of a six-year-old and a four-year-old, they sure seem like psychopaths. They sure seem <laughs> oh, to exhibit. Sure. They yeah. sure seem to exhibit. Because you're yeah. like, I thought you got, that's where you were going. What I you got to do? Yeah. What you got to do is identify them when they're young. I'm like, identify a complete disregard for consequences, and I want what I want, and who cares what other people want? That's but have you a a, ever had a conversation with your kids about, hey, when you took that toy from somebody else, do you? Th- how do you think they felt? You know? Yes, yes, correct. That's yeah. teaching empathy. So yeah, kids are like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, does your does your kid hurt your pet and does it care? Like deliberately hurt right. an animal? Yeah. Do you ever do the thing where you pretend that you're sad or crying and do they come to comfort you? Uh, yes, when they were babies, yes, yeah. So I, I mean I yeah, kids are kids are egocentric. Yeah. And that means they only think from their perspective. Uh But as they grow and age through interaction with other people in school and you, they learn how to take other people's perspective. And and so, yeah, kids are very egocentric. You know, they don't care that you're tired in the middle of the night when they come and wake you up and say, I got a potty or I want a water or whatever. They don't care. But they learn to care. Mm -hmm. Do they have the capacity to care? Mm. And do you teach them about caring? Hurting animals. So that's where they get those. Well, uh, that's, you know, that's that's one. That's the one. That's where they get those questions where it's like, uh, did you once kill a bird and you realized you didn't feel anything and you wondered if you could do it to a person? Again, there is a psychopath checklist that a psychologist developed. Okay. But this is done through assessment by a psychologist on people who have done actual criminal acts. So just having a person that's done, or a child that's done one act, you know, of meanness doesn't mean they're a psychopath. That's right. what I always am so afraid of, people identifying, because once you label someone, yeah, that's just self-fulfilling prophecy right there. There are so many things, like um, 
um, attention deficit. Right. Disorder. Like that's an actual thing that children do suffer from. Right. Let's be careful. Right. And, labeling they, and that's what I call childhood be careful. ADHD. One yeah. behavior in one setting doesn't mean your child's a psychopath, mm-hmm. but continued behavior in multiple settings may could be a problem. You know, and typically children who could be later identified as antisocial personality have, like, break the law repeatedly, um, hurt other people repeatedly, uh, don't care about rules. But again, think of an adolescent. You know, adolescents break the law, break the rules, you know, but is it just a temporary situation until they learn? You know, and can they learn consequences and does it bother? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and it, it, you know, learning is so experiential, right? You, right. You make the mistake, and then you, it becomes whether or not you find value in not making that mistake again. Right. right. Are there consequences to it, and do you care about the consequences? And that's usually what you see in adolescents, right? right. Is they're just not even aware there are consequences. Right. 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 They don't have that long-term thinking, nor do they think about how anyone else is affected. Right. And once they see that. Right, that's going to change the decisions exactly. they make in the future. Yeah. Let's, let's tie that to something earlier we were talking about mm-hmm. in this conversation. Um, we were talking about true happiness comes from connection. Mm-hmm. Um, can psychopaths, I, I'm, saying, I'm saying it because I've been saying it for my entire life, can people with antisocial disorder, can they have meaningful human connections? Typically, they're relationships are basically shallow and manipulative can they learn human connection i would hope so you know but again the research is ongoing with that and how do we teach them again if i'm going to have a connection with you i have to understand how you feel and i have compassion with you so can you teach those things yes it just is going to take a lot of effort and time now you uh did tell me earlier that please correct me if i'm wrong Psychopath was once a medical term. Well, what happened I, there? I think psychopath. You, I actually looked it up for this podcast. It was sure. the the term was uh, developed back in the 1800s. Okay. So psycho and it, it means unsafe mind or you know. Um, so <laughs> the DSM five has been through five, or actually more than five editions, but. It just gets revised as research. It's just like any science. As research is ongoing, you discover more and more different patterns and how things work. And so the personality disorders with antisocial personality disorder is just about that they don't have the same social needs as someone else. They don't have the same social connection. And so they just, as we've understood how the mind works, there's just different terminology that somehow expresses what that mental illness actually is. It's interesting that you say it that way because I'm coming at this from my bias, which is deep interpersonal connection is a necessary part of my existence. But I hadn't considered for them, Mm -hmm. maybe they don't have as deep relationships. Maybe they're not really hunting for it. It's not kind of a need that they need filled. Yeah, like I need my friends and my husband and stuff, you know, to be happy, but they need, they don't go that deep necessarily. It's kind of all about the next thing they can get from someone so that i I know what everybody is doing (laughs) i know what everybody is doing right now who is listening to their conversation is they're diagnosing their family and their friends right now uh jared are you diagnosed have you diagnosed anybody yet as we sit and have this conversation i think i've had this thought before (laughs) people do it in my abnormal psych class every time yeah like i think like you've finally explained brian to me thank you so (laughs) much yeah so is sociopath is that a non-medical term is that a different it is not and psychopath sociopath sometimes are interchangeable uh sometimes people think of a sociopath as not like that they can have feelings more and a little bit more conscience but they still break the law and stuff so maybe not as severe as a psychopath it's kind of, again but people use those terms interchangeably and the if i remember correctly from taking abnormal mm-hmm. uh is that the uh psychopath doesn't know it's wrong a sociopath does know yes. it's wrong it's yes. wrong but doesn't anyways right like a sociopath understands feelings or compassion and rules but then they just disregard them and don't care about that you know as that much. seems worse mm, yeah because they understand it yeah it yeah. seems they, yeah i guess but a, but think about a psychopath doesn't even understand why mm-hmm. yeah you know, someone is uh, upset or yeah 
Because how many times we have conversations, or at least I, me personally, I don't know what this revealed. Maybe maybe I'm self-diagnosing here, but there, how many times we have conversations about how um, uh, do, do people doing evil things know that they're doing evil things? Kids can do evil things. They can really hurt mm-hmm. other people. Right. They don't fully, as we've talked about already a couple times, they don't fully comprehend right. what they're doing to people. Yeah. Um, so it's a sociopath seems to come a little closer to Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting, the whole thing about evil. Zimbardo is a psychologist out of Stanford that studies evil. And he's his question is, are people born evil or is it their circumstances that turn them evil? And if you look at psychopaths and people in prison who are horrible criminals, most of them have a lot of trauma and awful abuse and stuff in their background it doesn't excuse the behavior but it might get us closer to explaining that you get into a cycle of of trauma and abuse and then you make some really bad choices out of that and then it just kind of spirals into you're this delinquent that then becomes somebody that no one's ever shown you compassion or empathy and then you don't know what that feels like or looks like with the clinical background on this topic do people actually in your field say evil um, I don't know. Concept, I don't guys? know that that would be a clinical term, mm. but that is a term that's in culture. And that's like, so then Zimbardo wanted to study, okay, you know, if you look through, look through history, at, yeah. you know, it started off with his colleague was um, a social psychologist that did the Milgram, Stanley Milgram, did the obedience study. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one, but. And that's where he had people, they thought they were shocking other people. Oh, yeah. So that's Stanley Milgram. And he and Zimbardo were colleagues. And Stanley Milgram was studying that topic because of what the Nazis did to the Jewish people. And that, I, sorry to sound so excited about that, but it's just a fascinating study. Right, but that's that's where they began studying evil. Because were the Nazi soldiers actually evil? Or were they just regular people that were in horrible circumstances and that were doing what everybody else did? Yeah. doesn't excuse it. But that's kind of where they begin to study what makes us do evil acts and or it, bad things. And, you know, most of the time it seems like people believe they're the the just one. Right. right? They believe they're the hero. Right. They, 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 for whatever reason, see what they're doing as this just act. Because you do dehumanize another person and don't make them human. You, if, as long as you don't see them as a human, yeah. you don't you don't have empathy for them. Then you can do whatever and think this is justified. And so again, we, I don't know if we've gotten far off track, but I mean that's just what psychopaths do is do things to people that are dehumanizing, you know, um, and don't have like if you're killing someone. You don't have any feeling about it. One of my favorite quotes, Jared, you just inspired. One of my favorite quotes is, villains are the heroes of their own story. Uh, Oftentimes, like you said, oftentimes they think that they're on the right side of history. They're on the right side of an issue. Yeah, I mean, more often than not, people aren't doing something thinking they're doing something protecting their. They're protecting their group. It's oftentimes their, their self. It's oftentimes defensive. Right. In some of the worst corners of politics, you will embrace aggressively immoral policy. Obviously, we're talking about radical positions here, not normal political parties, but you will embrace radical, aggressive, I think most people would say unethical positions, but you're doing it because many times you're being fed a narrative that your way of life is under assault. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, if, hey, if that means resorting to drastic measures, so be it. Because you're protecting something that's important. So that's not necessarily a psychopath. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So then that is just bad behavior based on protecting what is important to you. And then a psychopath might be a serial killer. Mm. What's he protecting? Nothing. You know, he's, if he's killing people, whoever he identifies that needs to be killed, He's not protecting anything. He's just doing it out of whatever, you know, whatever is compelling him, whatever trauma, whatever. Uh, so that's, you know, that's a next level so of since bad you behavior. Brought up serial killers, <laughs> what is the fascination? A lot of people are fascinated and with them. Now with, you know, Netflix yes. and these kind of yeah. on like order. Ted Bundy, I think Ted Bundy had a documentary on Netflix. I watched Mindhunters. I don't know if you guys watched that I on watched Netflix. That one, yeah. Our very own, as you've told us, our very own Andrea Jones here on campus teaches a class exclusively about serial killers, right? Right, and students 
are very fascinated about serial killers. <laughs> yeah, sure. Because I, and I I understand that because I like to understand what makes people tick. So then I'm not a serial killer, so I want to understand how someone else thinks so differently than me and how do they arrive at those behaviors that I couldn't even comprehend doing. You know, I think that's the fascination is how do people get to be that? And I think also it's it's basically I want to make sure that that doesn't get close to me. You know, it's like, what is that? You know, um, because it's so evil or awful or whatever term you want to use. It's like we don't want that awfulness close to us. So we want to understand it. You know, one time podcast guest and the great Jennifer Bump Mm -hmm. um, teaches a class at Richwood Valley um, about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And um, she uh, I, I, as a layman on the subject, I, I hesitate to wander in on that. But one thing you kind of learn about a lot of people that were involved in that persecution is kind of a million little steps <laughs> that got him there. It's a million little things of dehumanizing a whole population of people, making them bad, making them evil, making them they're going to, you know, interfere or destroy your life. You dehumanize them in small little ways over time. And I think that's how people arrive at those. That's why I cringe sometimes when we have like the law, not politicians, the law. The law refers to people who come to America illegally as illegal aliens. That that makes me uncomfortable. I understand what you're trying to say with alien, but they are humans. Right. Yeah. 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 When you dehumanize something, it's very easy to do evil or bad acts towards them. But like, I I don't know if uh, a psych, uh, a psychopath, uh, somebody with antisocial, I'm trying to change my language here. I'm trying to change my language here for, for, (laughs) (laughs) but it's somebody with those tendencies. I don't think they need a sales job. You don't need to dehumanize it for them. They're kind of predisposition to. If they had a sales job, they'd probably be really good at sales because they wouldn't mind, you know, manipulating you, be very good at charming you and manipulating you to buy whatever ever telling you things that might not be true about the product to get you to buy more of it you know that wouldn't bother them at all now that would be an interesting <laughs> I mean, let's it, measure let's met let's do let's perform cat scans and see the amygdala sizes of used car salesmen <laughs> now we are not saying that salespeople are psychopaths right, right. and that's <laughs> the thing and we're not saying like years, so. and we're not saying that ceo like because like they say a lot of ceos might not a lot but some ceos of big companies might be a, I saw a little bit psychopathic, an on that. yeah, um, because they might engage in policies that increase their profits without worrying about what it happens to their people or what happens to the environment or what happens to anyone else as long as the profit is made. And I actually read research that suggested that there was, a, there is, or was a culture that actually. Uh, supported that that you know kind of held up that mm-hmm. ideal yes. and actually made way for a, a, someone more psychopathic to take control right because again if our rewarded. culture pushes status and money and then you want your company to make more money then yeah our culture kind of supports well if you're tough enough to make all the money and make those policies and you don't care about the person down the line that it might hurt well, also another thing our culture does, and this wanders off the topic some, but another thing our culture does, especially with like the largest corporations in America, is they have shareholders. And you can have thousands of these, and what it does is it diffuses the responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, I was a part of a corporation that did this or that, and maybe it, it dumped a bunch of poisonous chemicals into a lake, but I'm just one of thousands right. of people. And I just, I, that, that's something that I think yeah. leads to that. Oh, for sure. Maybe there must be like a collective antisocial <laughs> dynamic that we can... <laughs> I think when you diffuse responsibility, you know, that's easier. But I think the person who's fully responsible is the CEO. And I think if they don't care at all, you know, maybe they have some tendencies towards mm. that. I don't know. Not, again, not saying every CEO is like that, but it's, it's interesting for sure. So, yeah, when, when we talked about the idea of the, you know, the Netflix and this interest in this cultural interest in, serial killers there's there's a part of it that almost feels like you know they're they're viewed as heroes yeah and i know that's not across the board and that's not everyone's interest because you brought up this idea that the interest is in that's the other that's something i want to understand because i don't identify with it but there's a little bit of subculture that feels like 
they're kind of held up like they're, See, I there's a little bit of a hero, like hero worship almost. Is a serial killer the same as like a mass shooter? Um, I don't necessarily know that that's like one time mass shooter. Because I pick that up with mass shooters sometimes. Mass shooters will target vulnerable. Yeah. Pop, uh, vulnerable is the wrong word, although they can be. But yeah. like certain minorities yeah. and maybe and then you have pockets of the worst mm -hmm. parts of the Internet. Cheering I mean, they've on. killed more than one person. So, you know, like a serial killer. I guess they could. Fit a mass shooter does it in an episode, right? Though, whereas where a serial, serial killer does it typically over years, yeah. or and typically one at a time. Or, There's a, a, a methodical yeah. nature associated yeah, with it. Yeah, there's a planning. I mean, a planning over time and identifying specific. A lot of serial killers had specific types of victims, mm. you know, like hookers or, mm. you know, those kind of things. And um, yeah, Jared, Jared and I were are. Uh, Probably, I'm guessing you were in high school when Columbine happened, and that became a little bit, again, so. darkest pockets of the internet, but it became a rallying cry for a lot of people that felt very put upon in their high school experience, and man, how nice would it have been. Uh, and so I, I picked that up with mass shooters, but have you picked that up at all with serial killers? I mean, I'm sure there's a, I'm sh there's Maybe so much stuff on the dark web, I'm sure there's yeah. a group of people that right. think of them as heroes or think of them as, you yeah. know. I don't know, but yeah. I'm sure that's out there because there's all sorts of different things like that. But I think most of us are fascinated just to try to understand them, you know, yeah. to understand what is different about their brain and how they think. But I don't know about the hero worship thing. <laughs> I don't, I haven't done a lot of research or anything on that. So we got dark today. We did, we did. man. Oof. I, we should have seen it coming too, but yeah. <laughs> I still am like, oh, how did we? Of course, we talked about that. So how could you yeah. not? When you're talking about people that don't care about consequences and they'll, they'll swing a sock full of nickels at society if it gets them what they want. I think it's interesting though to see how many programs or TV shows are, are darker in nature now, and I always mm -hmm. think that's interesting because sometimes I try to find a TV program that's not darker in nature. But Even subtly, yeah, you really see that woven through comedy yeah. and dramas. And yeah, I don't know if that has anything to say about our society or not. But So, uh, you know, let's, let's leave it on a little lighter note. Is, is there anything um, going on around the college or anything that you would just like to brag about? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think that the faculty at OTC are doing a great job with the pandemic and during the pandemic, and I would like to brag about that as overall just not been an easy time for anybody but I think we've all done a really great job of putting our students first and our students have done a, a I, great job can I build on that because sure. I've said this endlessly in private but I want to say it publicly um, uh, our our colleague dr. Bateman mm -hmm. the work she has done mm -hmm. um, and, and, and helping students manage COVID right has not been perfect but it's been about as darn close yeah. as you can get yes. and right. helping us as instructors incredibly important. managing what's happening outside the classroom and keeping correspondence with us inside the classroom is yes i just think teachers in general during and again there's been lots of frontline workers who've had it hard too but since i'm a faculty and teacher then i think just highlighting how teachers have kept it going in difficult times is a bright spot in our world and i think Again, what matters in life is connection and purpose, and it feels really good to uh, have that sense of purpose in helping students, you know, find their right path in life. There's our high note to end on. <laughs> Absolutely, we, we brought it out of the <laughs> yeah. out of that dive. Well, uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for coming on. Uh, we've learned uh, off the bat that we are misusing the term psychopath and need to talk about it in terms of antisocial behavior. Um, uh, we'll definitely look into those researchers on flourishing. Uh, Andrew, I didn't know that. How about you? I did not know that. Now you do. Thanks so much. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs>